Paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. Friends, will you hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord? Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks, you can be seated. I want to tell you a story. Years ago, Hannah and I were attending this great church in Tulsa uh, by a pastor named Eastman Curtis, who was really a great pastor for the season that we were in. But most of his life, he wasn't a pastor. He was actually an itinerant minister. And as a young man and a young father, he and his wife would travel the country in their car and they would preach at churches. Now we're Presbyterian and we're probably unfamiliar with this style of thing, but if you're from the South or you're Baptist or Pentecostal maybe, you might be familiar with uh, how itinerant preachers are paid and how they sort of eat and get along. And the way they do it is they would preach typically at a small Southern church. You'd have your normal uh, tithes and offerings for the church, but after the sermon, the senior pastor would get up for the evangelist or the preacher or whatever and, and would take what's called a love offering. And that love offering was almost a vote of support for this itinerant preacher. It was like a way of saying how much you liked him. And always that love offering, the total amount um, in, in almost every case would be given to the preacher and then usually the church would add a little extra to say thank you. So Eastman and his wife, they had just had a baby and they preached at this fairly large church, and it went really well. Everyone was super excited. And at, afterwards, same thing, senior pastor takes a love offering, and this huge amount of money comes in. I mean, there was just an outpouring of love for Eastman and his family. And at the end of the service, everybody went home, and the, minister, the senior pastor came to our pastor, Eastman, and and said, the amount of money that came in was just too much. We have too many needs. We can't give you this money, but here's $100. It'll give you enough gas to get to your next town. And he and his wife, they were heartbroken that they would be effectively betrayed, cheated, that the money would be stolen. Almost definitely the church would not be told that the money had been taken. And as they literally were sitting there brokenhearted, I think even crying, they, they made a decision in their heart. <clears throat> that money is not his, and it's not ours. It's God's money. And they said, we're going to view this differently. Instead of being victims in this moment, even though we were victimized, we are going to see that money as seed. And we're going to believe that that money going into that church will be like seed we're planting, not just into that church, but into God's kingdom. And we're gonna believe that God will do something great with it. For me, as a 19-year-old young man, hearing that story, I was deeply touched. That someone who, you know, I, I'm half Irish. Is that enough to say, <laughs> oh man, there would have been bloody knuckles and <laughs> screaming and so, so to, to think about resources and money that way was a good thing to learn from my pastor. And this is a phrase he used a lot. I don't know if it was original to him, but it's one that's, that will change your life if you can see your money, whether you're rich or poor, if you can see your money this way, it will change your life. My money is not mine, it's God's. I am not an owner, I am a manager. The first thing, let me appeal to the selfish side of all of us that's there. I, I know this message has been overplayed, okay? But we cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater. God blesses generous people. It's in the Bible. It's either true or it's not true. And uh, if you go to Whole Foods for lunch after church today, I might see you there, I don't know. And you find the crunchiest, hippiest person, you know, around. And you go up to them and you, say, and you listen to what they're saying. You might hear them say something like, you know what, bro? Bro. Bro. 
whatever you put into the universe, you're going to get back, bro. And though this isn't always true, I love that society is beginning to say and notice things like this because I do think that is true in part. That when we are generous, what we, what we give away, we get back very often. And more when we serve God and trust him with faith. In other words, the more resources you commit to God, the more resources God will commit to you. I believe that. I believe it with all my heart. And I believe no matter how rich you are, how poor you are, whether you're in abundance or whether you're struggling, give. Give. Give to people in need. Give to the poor. Give to young people. Give to students who can't afford a meal. Uh, Give to people who are struggling. Give to your church. Give to ministries. And watch as just all of heaven opens up and God begins to bless you in ways Not just financially, but so many ways that he begins to bless you because you're becoming a generous person. This is, in the end, what really matters. We all know the axiom, you can't take it with you. That it's not what you make in life, it's what you give away. And, you know, in life, we we really struggle with this. And there's this great story. Um, In fact, I want to tell you two stories today. One is this very dark parable that Jesus tells about the barn, and the second is the rich young ruler. Okay, so the first, Jesus has this grand following of people with him, thousands of people. And he's an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. He begins teaching and preaching. And all of a sudden, these two brothers come up and they've been fighting and arguing. And one of them says to Jesus, he says, Lord, tell my brother to share our father's inheritance with me. Or get, tell him to give me the rightful amount that he owes me. Something like that. This is, I think, what Jesus sees when these two guys are fighting with each other. And he looks at them and he snaps and rebukes them and says, Who made me the judge of you? And he actually says, Watch out. And he looks at everybody and says, Watch out for greed. And he says, Because life uh, does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Jesus tells the story then, and he says, there once was a man who had this great harvest, and he pulled in all of this grain, and it was too much for his barns to fill. So he built a bigger barn and filled it to the top with grain and said to himself, now I will eat, drink, and be merry for the rest of my life. I can relax. And God said unto the man, you fool, this day you will die. And it was all taken from him. When I read the story, you know, I began to think, if I were Jesus and I wanted to give a version to, you know, very often rabbis will tell two stories. One, two men had an abundance and two men had barns. And the first man did this and the second man did that. If I were, I think if I were trying to guess how Jesus would tell that sermon, he would say, but the second man had an abundant harvest and he built a great barn and he filled it to the top and he invited the poor and the widows and the hungry to come and have a banquet with him and celebrate. And he gave. I just believe giving is the only thing that is the difference between abundance and greed. It's the only difference. Can I tell you, being a pastor, you know a lot of people, a lot of poor people, a lot of rich people. There are rich people who give, and there are rich people who never give. There are poor people who give all the time, and there are poor people who never give. And the rich people and the poor people who give are more like each other than the rich people and the rich people and the poor people and the poor people. Because almost in every case, people who give are joyful people. You're a joyful person. When when you give and you give out of abundance, when you give out of lack, no matter how you're giving, God will bless you. And I've even seen, actually, you know, we've worked a lot with the homeless, and and homeless people are generous. It is such a wonderful thing to see, especially when you're feeling stingy and you don't know if you should share. I remember seeing a video once of 
a, a homeless man and they sort of had a hidden camera and a guy gave him $100 and then secretly filmed what he would do with that money. A lot of people think, oh, he went and bought drugs and alcohol, but he didn't. He went to a grocery store, he bought a bunch of food, and they went down to a place where there were a bunch of other homeless people and he shared the food with them. Now, it's not always the case, but I can tell you with the, the time that we have spent personally getting to know uh, our homeless neighbors, in many cases, they're very, very generous. And that in, in so doing, they're inheriting the kingdom of God. So maybe you're here today and you, something great just happened in your life or you have some, some big thing that happened and, and I, I want you to enjoy luxuries. I want you to have good things, but I want you to think about the needs of your neighbor, your church, your charities. If you have a couple that's next door that has little kids, maybe buy them dinner in a movie. Or if you're uh, having dinner or lunch and you have a server that seems like a single mom or a student, Maybe give her a hundred dollar tip and write on the ticket, God loves you and so do I. Watch what God can do when you become a more generous person with the little that you have or the lot that you have. You just see that God will pour out abundant blessing in your life. And in fact, it is generosity that is the only thing that draws the difference between abundance and greed. Amen. Abundance becomes greed the day you stop giving. Greed becomes abundance the day you start giving. And I'm so thankful to be in a church full of generous people. Not only people who support this church, but people who support each other. The more generous you are, no matter how poor or rich you are, the more life you will have and the more joy you will have. Listen to the Lord and ask him to give you wisdom and to give you a generous heart. Now don't be foolish. Right? You're still a manager. It's still not your money. It's God's money, right? What makes a great manager of a household? Is it someone who just foolishly throws it all away? Is it someone who never gives it all? No. You, there is wisdom always uh, in what makes a good manager, so be wise. Okay, the second story I want to tell you about is a more famous story about the rich young ruler. And before we do get rich young ruler, we're going to do a quick review of the Ten Commandments. I know everyone in this room and everybody watching on TV has the Ten Commandments memorized in order from beginning to end. But just in case you don't, I have included them in the slide behind me. Now before we read this, these commandments and just look over them briefly, um, we have to understand that in Jesus' day, anyone, anyone could name these word for word from beginning to end, not just the easy way that we have it here, but actually the way it's listed in Exodus from beginning to end with all of its context. Every single five-year-old or older knew the Ten Commandments and the Shema. Every kid that was 12 or older had the whole Torah memorized and probably Psalms and Proverbs. So when Jesus is talking to this young man, he's about to cite the Ten Commandments, everyone in that group has the Ten Commandments memorized. We got it? Here they are. It's a quick review. Jesus is teaching, and a very good man that everyone admires, who is young and wealthy, comes to the Lord. We don't know how he got his wealth. Perhaps he inherited it. Perhaps he was like a you know, Silicon Valley tycoon, who you know, sold his website or created some tech thing for whatever reason. He was shrewd, he was wealthy, he was well-to-do, but he was also a godly man. And he comes before Jesus and he asks this question, good teacher, how do I inherit eternal life? You hear the yearning there? I've got everything in the world. I've got all I could want. Reminds me of Barry Zito's story. I've got everything I could want in life and something is missing. What do I need? And here is what Jesus says. Can we show the Ten Commandments slide? Here are the ones that he doesn't say. So he says, everybody's listening. He says, honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. And you shall not bear false witness. Those are the five that he says. Now, now, this is a classic rabbinic means of teaching, where you say part of a scripture and you leave another part out. You're supposed to, it's a genius way of teaching, and everybody goes, oh, I get it. I get what you're saying. Because look at what he's leaving out. I am the Lord your God. 
You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath and you shall not covet. Those are the ones he doesn't say. So everybody goes, ooh, very bold. But notice, this young man, in all of his passion for God, his deep desire to get something, just something from Jesus. How do I have true life? How do I have it, Lord? I've got everything, but something is missing. Jesus says this, the five, but not the ten. Everybody goes, ooh. And instead of the man getting it, he looks and he says, I've done all that. I've done it since I was a kid. Then there's an even longer pause. And Jesus looks at him and, and there's something else I want you to know in the context. You've heard this before, but in Jesus' day, the greatest honor is to be called to follow a rabbi. It was usually done with young men. And in those days, if you were asked to follow a rabbi, it would be like the greatest thing that could ever happen to a person. And it says, when this young man said this, it was almost like Jesus could see his heart for God. And he looks at him and he says, one thing you lack. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and to those who are in need. Then come and follow me. In other words, he's offered this man to be one of the 12 disciples. Did you catch that? This is the one person in the whole Gospels that's invited to become one of the 12 disciples and says, no, I'll take the money instead. I think in his heart he knew. And in fact, if this man had said yes and had given his money away and had followed Christ, we would, we would know his name. There'd be churches all around the world named after him. There might be a gospel named after him or a letter named after him. And by the way, he still might have been wealthy. John Mark was wealthy. There were other disciples among them who were wealthy. Why did he ask this man to sell everything and give it to the poor? Because in Judaism, you don't get rid of some of your idols. You get rid of all of them. And I believe that if this man had decided to sell everything and give it to the poor, if he had taken that leap of faith and obedience to Jesus, it's not true of everybody, but if this man had done that, I think God would have given him even more back in abundance and in many other ways. I just believe that. God loves generosity. And he asked this man to be generous. But instead, it says that the man turned and walked away sadly because he had great wealth. And Jesus was actually, it seems like he's surprised. He looks at the young man walking away and he says, surely it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a wealthy person to enter the kingdom of God. You know what everybody's response is? Then Lord, who can be saved? Because you have great men and women of God who are wealthy, you have those amidst them that are wealthy. And Jesus says, all things are possible. Did you catch that, by the way? One of the most quoted Bible verses in the Bible, all things are possible, is in reference to the idea that wealthy people can go to heaven. But the reason they say who can be saved is because many among them viewed themselves as in some way wealthy. Well, Jesus gives us the answer. The answer is not about having or being poor or having a lot. The answer is how... It's how you view your resources. And he, he goes on and he says, seek first. Right? He says, don't worry about all these things. Don't worry about what you'll wear or what you have. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what? All, everybody say all these things. All these things. Look, it's not that God doesn't want you to have all these things. It's about first things first, second things second. It's about being a generous person. It's about recognizing that when your church is in need, you help it. When your neighbor is in need, you help them. You do it with wisdom, but that you look at the abundance you've been given as a manager, not an owner. Many of you do that, and I am so thankful for you. And I bet if I got any of you up on this stage and I gave you a mic, you would testify to the fact that in your abundance or in your lack, you've never regretted being a generous person and loving your neighbor with your resources. Can I get an amen? That's it, man. You know, many of us here, we say, I, I'm going to give when I get, when I'm, when I get rich, Bobby, I'm, that's what I'm going to give. When I get wealthy, that's what I'm going to give. And by the way, studies show that's just not true. It's just not how people are. 
People who are generous when they're poor are generous when they're wealthy. People who are stingy when they're poor are stingy when they're wealthy. It's almost always true. You know, maybe you're here and you think, I'm not rich, Bobby. I'm not the 1%. Look, there's plenty of things on Wall Street that need to be fixed. And I understand a lot of the anger with the Occupy Wall Street movement that happened a while back. But I found it funny how many people, met, when they talked about 1%, they were like, but only Americans, not everybody else. Uh, Credit Suisse just released a study that if you take the whole global market and you narrow it to the top 1% of income earners, it's those making $32,400 a year. If you make more than $32,400 a year, you are the 1%. I'm just saying. Is it getting, to, is it getting hot in here? It's getting hot in here. And this is, this is what missionary trips and humanitarian trips helped me realize as a young man, when you go to Nepal and you know that the average income, the white collar person there is making $12 a month and you're flipping $20 bills to buy lunch, you look to them the way Wall Street types look to you. All this to say, you should join with the apostles and say, well then Lord, who might be saved? And he will look right at you and he'll say you. You know, God doesn't, there are plenty of pe wealthy people in the midst of Jesus. I think this is the only one that Jesus tells to sell everything and give it to the poor. But there are others too. In other words, it's okay to manage a lot. Just be a manager, not an owner. It's okay to have a lot and to be wealthy, but use it as, to the best of your ability and with the wisdom that you have to bless charities, uh, your church, your neighbor, poor people, and those who are in need. Just some examples, Zacchaeus was a wealthy guy who got his money and Jesus didn't tell him to sell everything and John Mark was wealthy, his mother was wealthy. In fact, John Mark's mother's house was a palace where the church, it became their headquarters in Jerusalem. I think I mentioned that last week. There was a woman named Susanna who was wealthy that supported Jesus' ministry. But the wealthiest among them was Joanna, the wife of Chusa. This is great. So Chusa historically was the manager of Herod's estate. And his job, I don't know how to say this, his job was to peddle their version of Viagra. I'm not joking. <laughs> there was a, a plant that was used to do the same thing that Viagra does. Chusa sold the stuff. He, had, he sold it exclusively to people as a, like, a, like an ointment that they could use for what that. And, <laughs> and that's how Chusa and his wife became incredibly wealthy. And it was that money that was used to support the bulk of Jesus traveling, food, and everything else he did. Tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. That's amazing. <laughs> and at no point did, did Jesus judge her or tell her to sell all of her Viagra and give it to the poor or anything like that. You know? so, Every person's heart is different. Everybody's in a different place. But what the Lord wants to see in all of us, whether we're rich or poor, is a desire to help, to love, and to be generous. To be giving people. Not because he needs the money, but because we need to be letting go of our need for all this stuff. All it, you, think, you think it'll save you? Man, all it takes is one lawsuit. One health problem. One bad business decision, and it's all gone. You can't put your faith in something like that. And all of us are going to face the reaper, right? All of us will die, and none of this will come with us. So what then? The answer is, we live to give. We live to give as managers to support, to help, and to, to see the kingdom of God flourish. And by the way, you'll, that'll be the happiest life you could ever live. I want to encourage you, no matter where you are, whether you're struggling or whether you're doing great, give to your neighbor, give to people that are, that are in need and watch as God pours out incredible abundance in your life. Lord, we thank you and we trust you with our resources. Lord, we know that at the end, like I actually just believe that many here are going to be challenged this week to give. They're going to feel it on their heart. Maybe someone in their life is going to be in need. And I'm going to ask, Lord, that you give us the courage.
to hold things loosely and to give to people who are in need, to give to our neighbor. Lord, we love you so much and we thank you that you are the most generous person in the universe. You so loved the world that you gave us your only son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming today, guys. You are so loved. You're doing better than you think. And God is on your side. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi friends, we are so happy to have you join us in worship today. You are the beloved of God and we love you. As the end of the year approaches and we gather with friends and family to remember and express the gift of gratitude, we can choose to embrace God's goodness regardless of challenging circumstances or difficult times. Psalm 107 says, Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. Because of who God is, we can grow through every season knowing that everything will work out according to His good plan and purpose. That's right. As the Hour of Power enters its 50th year of broadcasting the good news of Jesus, our legacy is a testimony to His unfading faithfulness through times of trial and triumph. And your continued support makes it all possible. As a thank you for your friendship, we'd love to send you our Living Legacy 50 Years of Hour of Power 2020 wall calendar. Call, write, or go online to request this brand new, one-of-a-kind, Our Living Legacy 50 Years of Hour of Power 2020 wall calendar. Filled with historic photos, encouraging scriptures, and an encapsulated history, this 13-month calendar is yours with a gift of $30 or more. As you enjoy it throughout the year, we pray it reminds you of the vital role you play in the past, present, and future of this ministry and of our gratitude for you. For your gift of $60 or more, we'll include our uniquely designed Thankful Heart Stoneware Mug. This 16-ounce artisan mug is designed for wrapping your hands around for comforting warmth. We've embossed the word thankful on the exterior as a reminder of how grateful we are for your continued prayers and support. Call, write, or go online today and request these special offers. Your generous gift will enable us to start 2020 positioned for even greater growth. This year has been challenging for our power, but because of your willingness to come alongside us, we are walking by faith into our 50th year of ministry. Your generous financial gift will ensure that our legacy continues to unfold for another 50 years so new generations can know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Thank you, and remember as always, God loves you, and so do we. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is a